Uh, it's a pleasure to have with us today uh, Professor Laura Waller. Uh, Laura is um, an expert on uh, doing counterintuitive, counterintuitive things with light and thus with cameras and imaging. Uh, she's uh, um, been uh, recognized in many ways as a uh, Packard Fellow, a Gordon and Betty Moore investigator, and more recently as a Chan Zuckerberg investigator. And uh, today she'll tell us about some of the tricks that she does with imaging. Great, thanks. Um, so this might be a little different than what you're used to. Um, we are working on computational imaging and microscopy. So uh, it's building and engineering, designing, building imaging systems um, that use computers as part of the imaging system. And so uh, what I mean by computational imaging is that we are designing these imaging systems jointly in terms of the hardware and the software. So whatever is best done by optics, do with optics. Whatever is best done by computation, do with computation. And I think of this as having two pieces. So you have this image system design piece. This is very much a black art. Um, there's a lot of black magic in here. But you're fundamentally trying to map some information about whatever you're trying to measure. In our case, it might be super resolution information or phase information, 3D. You're trying to map it into some measurements by designing some imaging system A. And my group works a lot on making sure that that imaging system is cheap, simple, easy to build, robust. Uh, and then the second part is the algorithm. So it's more straightforward, but not always easy to solve for x from your measurements y. But the real heart of computational imaging is the interplay between these two. That we're always iteratively designing back and forth between what should be done by the optics versus the computation. And we don't have people that are hardware specialists and people that are software specialists. I just force everyone in my group to learn both. And that's really where all of the synergies in these image system designs come from. So I want to start with an example. This is a canonical example of uh, lensless imaging. So take your camera and just remove the lens. It's just a sensor pointed at the world. I take a picture that looks like garbage. And now, so this picture has the same light rays that would have hit the camera if I had had that lens in place. The only thing that's missing is that the lens was there to bend the rays in a particular way. And so if I could computationally bend those rays, shouldn't I expect to be able to reconstruct the image from this measurement? Uh, the answer is essentially no. Uh, it's far too ill-posed of a problem to do. Um, so what we did is we need to change something in the hardware because the measurement is not sufficient. And so what we did is we put a diffuser uh, literally just a bumpy piece of plastic. This is like the stuff you put on your windows so your neighbors cannot see in the privacy glass sticker. We just stick that on top of our sensor and take another picture. So this picture also looks like garbage, but now it's structured garbage. And from this image, I'm gonna tell you how we can reconstruct the scene that was out there in the world. Uh, okay, so uh, the sort of hard part of what we do is this integration that you need to put together your hardware and software in the smartest way possible. And in my lab we focus a lot on trying to push the limits of imaging but without any fancy new physics or very expensive hardware because we're really focused on making things that are easily adoptable by other people so you can replicate this in your own lab or sometimes in your own home. Uh, and I'm going to talk about two particular projects that do this. One is this diffuser cam project that I already mentioned, the lensless camera. Um, they both have these properties of being really scalable in the sense that you can make a lot of them easily and efficient data capture. So we're going to make sure that we're not capturing wasteful information uh, by using some advanced computation. So this diffuser cam one, I just showed you this. It's just this scattering element in front of a sensor. Um, so I want to explain how it works. You can build this on just about any sensor. It's the cheapest one with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, but it's different than a regular camera. So a regular camera, you're trying to take these measurements Y of some scene X, and optical designers have spent centuries, literally, trying to make imaging systems that are as close as possible to an identity matrix, meaning that you exactly replicate what you're trying to measure on your sensor. Um, so we want to get away from that with computational imaging uh, by looking at systems where uh, in, in later cases, you'll see that it's not always even a linear system, but where you can map your scene uh, sort of to linear combinations of your measurements and vice versa. 
And so this A matrix represents the system that we're going to design. So the Ford model for the system is described here. Um, and you're trying to map this object into your measurement. So the measurement is completely indirect. It doesn't necessarily look like your final result at all. But that allows you to uh, do all kinds of extra things that I'm going to talk about. So I need to know this Ford model, right? And so for this case with the scattering element, I could uh, measure it or I could model it. So I could go and put a point in my scene and just move, scan it across the entire scene and measure its response. Those are the columns of this A matrix. This would be the brute force calibration method. But we have like a one megapixel sensor, say that's actually low end. Then I need to take a million pictures and then invert a one million squared matrix in order to solve the inverse problem here. And that's not really something that you're going to do at home. I don't want you to have to require some precision mechanical stage to be able to even calibrate this thing. Um, we could model it if we knew the surface shape of this diffuser surface, but we don't because it's just random, uh, it's just a random material that I cut out from a piece of plastic. And so we're going to go back to the optics to, to solve this problem, to make the whole thing more practical. Um, and I have to talk about, uh, again, the difference between regular camera and our diffuser camera. So regular camera, a, scene in the, a point in the scene gets imaged to a point on the sensor. So the impulse function or point spread function is a point, right? With this diffuser cam, a point in the scene maps to this weird caustic -y pattern. It really is a caustic. It's like what you see in the bottom of the swimming pool on a hot day because you've got a random refractive surface uh, sort of randomly focusing light in different places. Um, and so if I move that point in the scene, what happens is basically the same caustic pattern shifts. And this is, an art, this is because uh, the diffuser is placed close to the sensor, everything, and it's, it's a relatively like, smoothly varying diffuser. So it's obeying proxial approximation, so you get this shifting effect. Um, and it, it'll always just shift depending on where the point in the scene is. If I turn on two points, then I get the linear sum of the two. Everything is linear in intensity. That's also because the diffuser is close to the sensor. It's within the caustic distance that your wave optics and ray optics actually match at the, this plane. So it wasn't sort of uh, it it wasn't uh, totally random that we put this diffuser close to the sensor. So with uh, just to show that this shifting is true, this is real data. I have a diffuser cam and my iPhone camera flashlight, and I'm just moving it around to show that it's essentially the same pattern, just shifting when I shift the point in the scene. So that's beautiful, because it means that I know the response to every point in the scene from a single calibration measurement with just your, your iPhone flashlight on as a point source. And it means that this A matrix, or forward model, is a convolution matrix, which is fully defined by a single column. So I just take one calibration measurement, and I'm done. I know the whole A matrix. And it's a convolution, so I don't actually need to instantiate it. I can do this all with FFTs, so it's extremely computationally efficient. Uh, I'm ignoring a part that when it shifts off the edge of the screen, there's some cropping that we need to deal with. Uh, but that's not so difficult to deal with. OK, so uh, the inverse problem here is to solve for the object simply by deconvolving out this point spread function. Um, so we can take some raw data and reconstruct our scene. This picture is much prettier. Um, <coughs> Uh, and we have this awesome group of undergrads, Camille and Shrias, who uh, made it work on a Raspberry Pi dirt cheap sensor with scotch tape as your scattering element so that you can make this at home. So they have a hardware software tutorial that you can do uh, online at home. We just put this up recently and we'd love to have some beta testers tell us what's wrong or what works and doesn't work. We've had a few people get it working already, so uh, it would be awesome to see other people try it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show a video now, and my video is to point out some of the problems with this strategy. So you can see there's like weird artifacts here, and they're almost surely model mismatch artifacts. You know, we did this calibration measurement, and then uh, it wasn't perfect, or the, the plastic elements started to melt a little bit, or it moved, or something like that. These things are, we could probably account for them in the forward model and get better results, but my point is that um, I don't think this is going to replace your iPhone camera anytime soon. The advantage of it would be that you could make it much thinner and lighter weight. I don't think it would be cheaper because these iPhone cameras are plastic lenses that are mass produced already. Um, so I just don't think that's the direction to go for this type of camera. 
So we wanted to think of things that uh, these kinds of lensless cameras can do that regular cameras simply cannot. Um, and one of those is 3D. So you have to think about uh, a, a normal camera has a focus plane, right? And everything that's out of focus is blurred. So once you measure something that's out of focus blurred, um, you're screwed. You can't undo blur. Um, so people have tried for a long time, and it's sort of just not a well-posed problem. Whereas these uh, lensless cameras don't have a focus plane. And so you can think about what's going to happen when I go to different depths in 3D and then try to use that to your advantage. So what does happen is shown here. So I've got my diffuser cam and a point source, and I'm just moving it backwards. And what you see is this caustic pattern simply scales with depth. And so this is really beautiful because we now know the response not only to every lateral uh, position because it's just a shift of the, the single calibration point, but now I know the response to every depth position. So I can map out uh, where that point was in 3D space for every point in the scene because we just have a linear combination of different points. So we can make this 3D model where we take a single 2D measurement that's say a megapixel big and we're going to now reconstruct a megapixel of uh, a megapixel image at every depth plane, and I'm just saying, approximately, say it was over 100 different depths to get 3D information. Um, and so, uh, if we were to brute force calibrate this thing, we would have needed to take 100 million different images and then try to invert this uh, 100 million size squared matrix, which is also obviously as another issue. But the, uh, so using this convolution model that we, that we took to, on the physics allows us to solve the calibration problem and the computation problem, making them tractable to do like on a laptop. Um, glaring third problem is that this is a severely underdetermined system. We're trying to solve for 100 times more things than we measured. And generally, there's no absolute solution to that. But uh, we can use compressed sensing to get at a a good solution for certain situations. So we're now restricted to being in situations where your thing you're taking a picture of has structure. And things tend to have structure when you're doing 3D imaging. They are not just going to be just ran totally random in 3D usually. So compressed sensing, I think a lot of people at Stanford know about it. It was a big deal here. Uh, but it's the idea that you can solve these underdetermined problems if you have sparsity in your uh, thing you're trying to reconstruct. So it's used as a prior. Uh, and I want to show that our system definitely is amenable to compressed sensing. So compressed sensing you don't get for free. You have to capture the data in a particular way, which means you need multiplexing. And in our case, we absolutely have multiplexing because a point in the scene maps to a lot of pixels on the sensor. And so if I start throwing away pixels on the sensor, then I still have information about that point because it went to other pixels as well. So I can take my raw image and throw away 80% of the pixels. It's a bit hard to see, but there's some bright spots there. So I randomly choose 20% of the pixels to keep and do the reconstruction, and it still looks pretty good. I can go to 10% only, and then only 2% of the data. I'm starting to lose quality, but I can still see the basics of the image, something you would not be able to do with a regular camera, because once you delete those pixels, the information is gone. But because now it's spread across lots of pixels, we can get away with this. So this system was sort of natively amenable to compressed sensing. Um, no reason to do it in 3D, in 2D because we collect enough data, but in 3D we need it. So here's our reconstruction. We're trying to minimize the measurement we took minus uh, the expected measurement we would get given the current estimate passed through our forward model, which is this convolution thing that scales with depths. There's a positivity constraint because there's no such thing as negative light. And then the compressed sensing is this regularizer term, uh, which in our case, uh, we're going to put it into a sparsity basis. The one we use is total variation. Uh, you can choose whichever one is appropriate for you. But total va variation means that the, the, the gradient of the object is sparse. And it's a pretty good one for natural scenes. Um, we solve all this with ADMM, which is an iterative uh, optimization solver in Halide, which uh, just uses your, your hardware on your computer very efficiently so we can do things fast. <coughs> the 2D we can easily do in real time on a laptop. The 3D takes a few minutes. OK, so here's a picture result. So here's the raw image, this single image raw image that looks like nothing. 
uh, and then we can reconstruct uh, the 3D object. So this is a 3D reconstruction and I'm just spinning it for visualization. It's a little a set of leaves that we picked up in the lab. And so we're getting pretty good depth information here. In fact, we're tr we can solve for 500 million voxels from this single 5 megapixel image, uh, but they're not all super useful because the, the voxel spacing varies as 1 over z, so the voxels get bigger as you go further away, and then they get, uh, they get wider as you go further away because it's a non-telecentric system. Um, okay, so this is a super fun toy to have in the lab, but we want to do some real science with this. Um, and so where we're going is towards microscopy. Uh, we already have a microscope version of this. You just make everything smaller, use smaller pixels. Um, and where I think this can be really valuable is if you think about microscopy, everyone's trying to do large volume image, 3D imaging uh, with high resolution. And generally, you have to give up time to do that. So if you do point scanning, you have to, take, you have to go at a slow speed because your speed just scales with however many voxels you're trying to get. Um, if you do something like light field microscopy, you get single shot, super fast 3D imaging, but you give up a lot of resolution. And I would argue that why do you have a microscope if you're going to go giving up the resolution that you paid for when you bought that objective? So where this diffuser cam operates is somewhere in here. Depends on sparsity. So if you have lots of sparsity, you can get the best of both worlds. You can do fast uh, 3D imaging with lots of voxels, so large space-bound products. Um, and I think this is really exciting because now you can start to think about um, your speed of capture scaling with the sparsity, or rather the number of pieces of information that you're trying to collect, not the number of voxels you want to resolve. And particularly for fluorescence imaging, uh, a lot of those voxels are dark, and so sparsity is a fairly good assumption. Um, so one of the projects we've been working on this with Hilal Adesik in the neuroscience uh, group is that it's trying to put this on mouse brains. And so the idea is that um, these things are thin, cheap, and lightweight. So you can mount this to the head of a mouse and it can run around and do, do activities and you can study its behavior while watching its neurons. Um, so I'm just going to show one from a zebrafish just because this video is easier to interpret. But you can see the two side lobes of the zebrafish's brain. And each dot here is uh, a detected neuron's like 3D location within that uh, 3D volume that we recover. And the, the color over time is the neuron's activity level at a given time because we're getting this 3D over time and we have to be able to do it fast sort of on the speed scale of how neurons fire, which is uh, quite fast. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done with this section. I want to talk about one really cool idea that one of my students, Nick, had and got his undergraduate, Patrick, to work on. He basically said that uh, we're using a rolling shutter to capture these raw data frames for our diffuser cam. And the rolling shutter, so you're just capturing one row of the image at a time and progressively going through. So the idea was that uh, since every point in the scene is actually mapping to all of the pixels on the sensor, then every row in this rolling shutter measurement actually contains information about the entire scene. And so he's going to try to reconstruct the entire scene from a single row measurement. And then he does it for the next row and the next row. So then you get a frame rate that's not the frame rate of the camera, but rather the line scan rate of this rolling shutter sensor, which can be thousands of times faster than the frame rate of the camera. So you get sort of for free uh, time super resolution if everything's sparse enough. Um, <coughs> and this is their first successful experiment with it. So from this raw image, they're reconstructing 150 frames of this Nerf dart hitting an apple sitting on a textbook. Um, and they're still working on this, but I think this is really cool and interesting that you just get this for free. Um, okay, so uh, that's like that project. And then the, the rest of the talk, I wanted to talk about another project that we've been working on a bit longer. Um, that's a different hardware platform. Um, but, but we're doing a lot of similar computational imaging concepts on it. And this is a microscope. This is like the cheapest microscope that has infinity corrected that I could buy when I was a first year faculty. Uh, and there's, we made one hardware change is to replace the illumination unit with an array of LEDs that are programmable with a, some sort of microcontroller. So this hardware is copied from a group at Caltech, um, but we're going to do some different things with it than they did. 
Um, and so what does this do? So patterning the LEDs, so the LED array is just sitting above the sample. So if I light up the central LED, I'm illuminating on axis. <coughs> if I light up the off-axis LED, I'm illuminating off-axis. So the sample always sees homogeneous illumination, but it's coming from different angles, depending on which LEDs I turn on. All right, so why would I ever care about doing that? Um, so I want to explain to you how that single hardware platform, just by choosing different LEDs to turn on, capturing different pictures, and then reconstructing the image in a different way with different inverse problems, we can do a bunch of different imaging modalities that are pretty useful in microscopy. Okay, so the easiest one first. If I just light up the central LEDs, I get a regular microscope image, bright field image, it just represents absorption. If I light up the LEDs that correspond to illumination by angles, that are larger than the numerical aperture of this microscope allows, that means that the illumination is not passing through the microscope. All that passes through is scattered light from the sample uh, of sub-resolution features. So you get this dark field image. Um, and then if I light up half of the LEDs in this circle, it's going to be a phase contrast image. Uh, so it has some phase information that we haven't yet mapped to quantitative. But this is really cool because you can just really quickly flip between these different uh, LED patterns and get simultaneous videos of all three of these. Uh, these are some of the most popular non-fluorescent contrast modes in microscopy that you would normally buy a specialized objective and condenser unit for and have to realign them each time. Uh, okay, so uh, that's like the, probably the most practical as far as like biologists using these microscopes go. Uh, this gigapixel imaging is the coolest thing that this microscope does. Uh, it's also known as Fourier typography. You might have heard of it. That there's a, it's a quite related to a lot of the X-ray work in typography. Um, but what it's after is large field of view with also high resolution. So uh, you can imagine why it's useful to have both. Um, and generally, you can't have both, right? You either zoom out and get a big field of view picture with bad resolution, or you zoom in on something and you can see it with high resolution, but only over a small array. And so. Getting both uh, is obviously useful, particularly for some degree disease screening applications that still use optical microscopy. You need to see inside cells looking for, say, malaria or something, uh, but you need to look at a lot of cells to see it. Um, this isn't a full gigapixel. It's one of the first images we did, but we now have a system that can do 15 gigapixels. And you don't get this for free. So uh, what we pay is time, and so we're going to have to trade off time for this. So uh, we start by using uh, a microscope that has a big field of view. So just take a microscope that has low magnification. It natively has a big field of view, but it has bad resolution. So we can't resolve the smallest features. And then I, take my, I do my little disco pattern shining the different illuminations on the sample and take a whole bunch of pictures of it with these different illuminations. Some are bright field, some are dark field. And from this raw video, I can reconstruct the higher resolution image. So this is a 0.1 NA microscope, and our, our reconstruction is at 0.8 NA. So we're, we're doing super resolution in that we're beating the diffraction limit of the microscope objective that we use. So it, it's a different kind of super resolution. Uh, and there, in principle, there's no limit to how much super resolution gain you can get. It's all practical limits. So eight is uh, a pretty high number for what you can practically do. Okay, so I want to explain how it works. So this is a fun part. Um, I need a little bit of Fourier optics. Uh, so this is the Fourier spectrum of the sample. Ux is spatial frequency at x, Uy is spatial frequency at y. And because I used a big field of view objective, it for sure had a, a small numerical aperture, meaning it filled in a small bandwidth in Fourier space. So if you like to think in terms of spatial frequencies, great. Uh, spatial frequency is essentially the same thing as the angle. So uh, the range of angles is similar to, to the bandwidth in Fourier space. So this is small range of angles, numerical aperture, means small bandwidth in Fourier space. So this is with the central LED. If I light up an LED over here, what happens? Well, now I'm illuminating the sample with an off-axis plane wave. It's like multiplying by a phase ramp. Multiplication by a phase ramp is, in Fourier space, a shift, right? So everything shifts in Fourier space. Uh, my pupil, or the aperture of the system, is in Fourier space. So I shift the spectrum in Fourier space, and then the pupil clips sort of the side of the spectrum, right? So when I light up my uh, off-axis LED, what I collect is it's still a circle with the same area, so it still has the same bandwidth, 
but it's a different part of this, the sample spectrum. If I light one up up here, I get all the sub-resolution features in the horizontal direction lit up versus vertical in here. Um, so the sort of maximum angle I can get to is the sum is related to the sum of the two numerical apertures of the illumination and the detection. So we have a low NA detection objective um, and a high NA illumination. This LED array is huge. In fact, we use domes now so we can cover the whole 180 degrees. Um, so then I can basically just go through and take, turn one LED on at a time and take an image. And then I can fill in this much larger bandwidth and now I should be able to get higher resolution because when I do the inverse Fourier transform of this, I get, it has a much bigger balance, so I have higher resolution, right? Okay, so not exactly. Um, the caveat is, that would be synthetic aperture imaging. And the caveat is that I didn't measure phase information. I measured intensity. And you better know the phase information in Fourier space if you want to do an inverse Fourier transform. Or everything will be ruined. Um, so we need to do both this synthetic aperture stitching things together in Fourier space and a phase retrieval algorithm. So we're only going to measure uh, amplitude, right? Squared. So we can do this and we can write it as just a really big optimization problem um, where we're trying to solve for the Fourier, trans the Fourier space of the object with this big bandwidth. Um, so our inverse problem is written like this. P is our pupil function. We actually do solve for that because it tells us the aberrations and then we digitally correct them and we need that to make good images. But this is just a big nonlinear, non-convex optimization problem. And so we can solve this and get at the result. And the reason the phase retrieval works is because of this overlap in the Fourier space. So how you solve it is important. If you just use basic gradient descent, it's fast. But as soon as you start to have less and less data or noisy data, you start to get weird artifacts. If you use a, a second order method, you get a much better result from the same data set, but it's really slow. So here's some commentary on speed versus accuracy. Um. <laughs> so recall we're trying to make a gigapixel image here. And this is just a 200 by 200 pixel patch of that gigapixel image. This is a patch that's the size of the spatial coherence area um, from the LEDs because it, we need to stay within the spatial coherence area and then do patch by patch reconstruction across the whole thing. We can parallelize it if we want to, so we could go faster. Um, but 100 seconds is a lot if you want to do a gigapixel <coughs> video, which I'm going to do later. So we started working on sort of finding the best algorithms that trade, uh, that take, it takes a little bit more time, but the result is much nicer. Um, oh, this. So yeah, so speed matters. And the one thing that is really cool is that we can easily choose which objective we use to choose to choose a trade-off between the field of view and resolution. And then we can choose which LEDs we want to use, what, what range of angles we want to use to trade off time. Because the more uh, super resolution you're trying to get, the more images you need to take, the more time you need to take. And your sample may not be able to tolerate it. You might be just blurring out all of the things you were trying to resolve. So you have to think carefully about this space bandwidth time trade-off when, you, when you're thinking about the particular sample. Uh, and I'm going to talk about 3D stuff later, so it'll get even more important that we go fast. Okay, so we wanted to go faster, and this overlap of the circles is not good because it means that we're collecting 10 times more data than we reconstruct. For someone who does computational imaging, that's like sacrilegious, uh, but you cannot just get rid of some of these measurements. And so, uh, I'm not going to really explain too much about how we design this, but basically if we turn on half a half circle of LEDs, three half circles of LEDs doubles our resolution, that's good value. That's in the bright field regime. In the dark field we turn on eight at a time, so it's eight times brighter, which means we can take eight times shorter exposure, and we fill in our Fourier space eight times faster. So we get about 100x speed improvement from this new pattern, which is the disco pattern that I showed you, rather than sequentially going one LED at a time. And that 100x speed has sort of got us into the realm of being able to look at live biological samples. Uh, so originally we were taking 10 minutes. There was also some hardware issues there. Um, and, and then with this multi, multiplexing by turning on different LEDs, we get, we get it down to 0.4 seconds. And we're not making any compressed sensing or sparsity assumptions here. This is for any general sample. Um, great, so here's some live samples. These are our cancer cells. You can watch this one divide. It cuts across the center. Biology 101 curls up in a ball and then it'll split into four or five cells. And it keeps a very long depth of field. So this curl up in a ball actually leaves the plane 
which would be way out of focus if we had a ADX objective which would only have this big of a field of view. So we also get the benefits of long depth of field um, from this. And uh, these are quantitative phase imaging, uh, so we can use just basic uh, segmentation software that biologists like to use that generally doesn't work on phase images. It will work if you have good low frequency representations. Okay, so this is all about space, time, space bandwidth time product. So we're trading all three of these things. And now we've sort of got what I thought was maybe the best of both worlds, um, or the best of all three worlds, uh, the best we can do in terms of efficiency uh, without sacrificing the quality of our results. But actually, um, some of my students have been thinking more about this and trying to think about more sophisticated designs. And this gets at some of the new things that we've been thinking about. That almost everything I've been talking about is these model-based uh, inverse problem solvers. So you use some iterative algorithm to solve an optimization problem that you set up based on the physics. We know the forward model and so we can, we can write out what the problem is. So it has lots of advantages that it's very interpretable, but it can be really slow. And this one's a big one. If I don't, if I say I know the forward model, I know that this angle was 50 degrees elimination angle. If it was actually 50.1 degrees, that can cause problems in my result. Um, and if you don't, if you get it wrong, then these model mismatch can cause artifacts, especially when you have efficient imaging systems where every piece of data matters a lot. Um, so you could just throw away all the physics and deep learn it by using a bajillion training examples. Uh, this also gets you to some faster recons. But there's a lot of problems with this, particularly philosophically for myself, that we don't know what's going on. Um, and we're throwing away physics that we know, which seems very, very wasteful. And so we've been getting into the physics-based learning. There's a lot of people thinking about this topic. How to put the physics together with the learning to, do the, to have each do the best of what they know. Um, so the way we do it is with these unrolled networks. We take our iterative algorithm and every, we make a neural network where every layer of the neural network is uh, one of the iterations of our iterative algorithm. And then we can start learning whatever we want within there. So essentially, the neural network architecture is defined by the physics the known physics of the system. And that makes it a very efficient neural network. Um, we can get away with uh, orders of magnitude less training data to achieve the same thing. And we have some interpretability because we kind of know what's going on at every step uh, within this iteration. So here's the case for, we use this approach to design uh, the illumination pattern. So this was the disco party pattern. It's a, a heuristic design that uh, a postdoc lay did. Uh, and it works pretty well. When we learn the design, uh, we get something different. It's really interesting to try to analyze these. I won't get into it now. But we can then get away with uh, taking less data. So with the, this is a little bit of a straw man comparison, but with just two measurements, we can get uh, a, a high quality result that, that the traditional one with four measurements wouldn't be enough. Um, so you're missing all the low spatial frequencies there. Okay, so. Uh, I don't have too much time left, but I'll quickly go through some of the problems. <laughs> okay, so uh, in computational, I mean, let's pretend you have a linear system. Knowing A is really important. You have to know A accurately or you're going to have artifacts. And we think we know A because we designed the thing. We built the thing, we designed it, and we aligned it. So uh, based on the physics and optical design, we should know the forward model. In reality, what grad students spend their time doing is calibrating. And this is very unsatisfying to me because I don't want systems that work beautifully for the figure that you put in the paper and then somebody sneezes and it never works again. This is not reproducible science. This is not adoptable. This is defeating the entire purpose of making the system cheap and simple because no one's going to be able to use it unless that expert postdoc goes and puts the right duct tape in the right place to get it aligned. And so uh, I want you to think about your systems and how many little pieces of physical or software duct tape you have in there that the system just wouldn't work without them, but you think they're not a big deal. You don't even write them in the paper or you throw them into the, like, at the very end, you throw in like a little thing that we did this image registration or something like that. So we want to get rid of this kind of thing because it's really making it hard for non-experts to adopt our methods. And uh, in this LED array case, we know what the problems are. So we know aberrations are a big problem, and we know 
the LED positions are. So the angle of the illumination is, is it always in error by a little bit. And even if you knew it exactly and calibrated it very carefully, you put in a sample that's floating in water and the refractive surface at the top actually bends the rays and changes those angles uh, as you're taking the data. And so uh, we, if we don't account for these things, we get terrible results. And there's no point in doing super resolution if you're not getting the, the effective resolution. So what we do is we, we're going to uh, parameterize these calibration parameters by theta. And then Regina doesn't want to physically calibrate, so she puts it into her inverse problem. So now we jointly solve for the, uh, the super resolved amplitude and phase of the image and the calibration parameters theta. We can put constraints on, or regularization on those calibration parameters based on what we know what they should be or sort of their range and limits. Uh, and then we can solve this joint estimation problem. So this has been super powerful for us. We call this algorithmic self-calibration. It makes our systems usable um, very easily. So now we can throw in our LED array. Don't worry about alignment. It'll figure it out in the software. So here's an example, low resolution, high resolution. This is a quantitative phase, so we can map this to the physical surface height. It's very accurate. And then these are the aberrations. Uh, this is the, the pupil wavefront phase that we get out of it. Um, since we do this on a patch by patch basis, we can get the aberrations at every point in the field of view. It very much changes a lot over these big fields of view, uh, especially when you use cheapo objective lenses. Um, okay, so last piece that I'll just quickly mention is that I've been talking all about having a sample and illuminating it from different angles and telling you how it shifts in Fourier space and it gives you super resolution. But when, usually when you take a sample and you illuminate from different angles, you're doing tomography. You're trying to get 3D information. And so everything I've been talking about is based on the sample being thin, which is generally true if you've got some cells uh, on, a, on a microscope uh, slide or something like that. But when your sample is thick, things are different. And you have to think about how the light projects through the sample at, in different ways at different angles. So you can either get 3D information from these different angles, or you can get super resolution. Or in our case, let's get both. Um, so you can write this as a giant neural network. Each node is the has the amplitude and phase of the sample at that point. So we're looking for a 3D transmission function. It's going to completely account for multiple scattering in the forward model only, because you know how light propagates from through the 3D object if you knew the object and you're trying to iteratively estimate this object. Uh, so it's, a, it's exactly like a big neural network. Uh, but unfortunately, it also is exactly like a big neural network that we have no idea when this will converge, when this will work. So we can heuristically figure out when it usually works, but that's about all we can do if, for now. Um, so here's some results. Here, this is uh, mouse embryos, and I'm just showing you different depth slices through the 3D reconstructed refractive index. Uh, but the story I want to get into for this that I think is really interesting is about the multiple scattering. Uh, because, particularly in biology, a lot of these samples are quite highly scattering. And uh, if they're too scattering, we can't image them. So um, scattering imparts a lot of degrees of freedom. And now we're starting to find ways to, now we're collecting a lot of diverse and redundant data. And we have four models that can model that multiple scattering. So we have a chance to solve the inverse problem to reconstruct uh, even with severe multiple scattering. Or maybe not too severe, depending on how you decide. Uh, that. So our forward model is pretty simple, actually. It's this multi-slice beam propagation. It's been used for a long time in electron microscopy. Um, and it's just treating the 3D object like a bunch of slices with 2D transmission functions with propagation between them. So uh, this one doesn't model backscattering. We've played with a lot of different forward models for multiple scattering. This one is a good trade-off between uh, time and memory and uh, accuracy. So uh, I want to show what happens. So if I have a weakly scattering object, so just a single cell is pretty weakly scattering, then um, when I take the Fourier transform of my measurements, I see all of the information stuck within these two circles. This is a signature of weak scattering. Weak scattering is firstborn. Firstborn approximation is weak scattering approximation. And so it's good enough for this sample. So multi-slice includes uh, multiple scattering. And so these match because the object wasn't multiple scattering. When I start to look at something like an embryo, which has lots of cells in it, then you see like these two circles are getting fuzzy. There's lots of stuff outside the two circles. That, it can't get out there without multiple scattering. And so this is more multiply scattering. And now you start to see some deviations between firstborn and this multi-slice. 
Uh, interestingly, what's lost is the low spatial frequencies, not the high spatial frequencies. So it doesn't blur, it loses low spatial frequencies. This is very common for phase retrieval. It's bad at low frequencies, not high frequencies. Uh, a C. elegans worm is very highly multiple scattering. Almost all of the information is just sort of totally blurred out. You don't really see the two circles. So this is like the most severe case of multiple scattering. And they're really not picking up the refractive index of this, uh, of this worm in the firstborn case right now. But we can do this pretty accurately here. So the last piece I'll show is just a big 15 gigapixel 3D refractive index reconstruction of a C. elegans worm. Uh, if I do this for biologists, I, could, I would point out the different, um, the different body parts of this worm, but I won't do that. I'll probably screw it up anyways. Um, uh, but you can see a lot of highly scattering things in here. So this is the central slice of a 3D reconstruction. And we could never get inside these worms before because of the multiple scattering. And now we're getting pretty clear pictures through the whole 3D volume. So at the end, you'll see it go to different depths. You can see a few artifacts here because it's not perfect. Um, there are some limits to this and we're still figuring them out. Um, but that's all I mostly wanted to talk about. Um, for these LED arrays, now we're using, uh, instead of the Adafruit arrays, which have all kinds of technical problems, we built a dome and uh, some of my students started a company actually, which I'm part of, I should disclose. But it's just to, to mass produce these LED arrays. They click into the condenser unit of a microscope. Um, and so you can really easily get this thing up and running in your lab if you want to. Um, and we have a lot of open source software and hardware um, for all of our projects because that's the point is to try to get people to use them. And we'd be very happy to work with you if you want to try some stuff. So thanks and happy to take any questions. Yeah, so um, that diffuser is, a, is just, uh, it's like a half degree Gaussian scattering profile. But basically any thin scattering material, uh, any thin scattering material will give you this uh, shifting effect. This is like the Raman Nath regime. Uh, so I, I call it paraxial, it's the, kind of, it's the same thing. Uh, people who do scattering will call it memory effect. So this is infinite memory effect, but it, it's really being effectively thin is the, the idea. Um, so that diffuser is not very high, like ground glass will be too much for this. Um, but it depends on your pixels. So if you had really small pixels, you would want a more highly scattering thing. Uh, the other thing it, it adjusts is your field of view. So if you use a more scattering diffuser, so smaller bumps, it will scatter to higher angles. Um, so you will get a bigger field of view. But then your caustic, you want it to put it at the caustic plane, so you'll need to place the diffuser closer to the sensor. And uh, you'll find that um, something more than, so we're putting this, we're like sitting it on top of the glass cover that's on the sensor um, and it, it is exactly the right distance. So we just tried a bunch of sensors and a bunch of diffusers. Um, but if you need to put it closer, you'll need to remove that glass cover, which is, means hardware modifications. But then you get the bigger field of view, but it also have worse resolution because you split the same pixels over the larger field of view. So it's, these are all just design considerations. Um, right now, we've been working a lot on banking better diffusers. So for the neural activity stuff, um, the signals are very low, so SNR is a big deal. And so these diffuser positive bumps focus light, that's good, but the, the negative bumps are spraying light out. So those point spread functions have sort of like a bias term on them, which is bad. And so uh, we've been building like essentially random lenslets instead. Uh, we we want to keep it cheap and simple, so we've been bashing ball bearings into copper and then making PDM, using that as a PDMS mold. It works pretty well. Uh, we've also done the full end-to-end -end machine learn design, the design in the same way I did for the LED array patterns, design the optimal diffuser surface. It's pretty close to the bashing ball bearings idea, um, but the placements will all be different and sort of like the different, app, you can adjust the apertures. Um, so we did that, it's, it's surprisingly not that much better than bashing ball bearings, but it is better theoretically, but we haven't been able to fabricate this thing accurately enough because it's like, 
a few millimeters. You have to have the full size of the sensor and then we're only going you know, 10 microns or so off the surface. And there's not really good fabrication tools for something like that. So a lot to take an idea is we've tried about 10 different things, including the nanoscribe here. Um, and we haven't found anything better than bashing ball bearings into copper. Uh, but that's where we're going next is you can design designer diffusers that are more optimal for particular situations. I think we can help you on that. <laughs> um, so um, when you're talking about unrolling your iterations into a layer of neural network, um, could you talk a little more about that? What, where are the weights? What is the training data for this? How does that really? Yeah, so uh, basically you, you can take the iterative algorithm and each, each layer is an iteration. So the things you're learning are, like in the LED array case, it's the brightnesses of each LED. That's what we want to learn. Um, and so each iteration, that's changing because it's being updated, so you have to copy it to every layer. Um, so a big problem with this is memory. If you have a, a lot of things you're trying to learn, like a lot of LEDs, then you have memory issues. And the training is that uh, we take like the sequential one LED at a time, we treat that as ground truth, um, and we, we feed in the measurements, and sort of like the, the tagging is the, the known, um, the result that you get from this sort of ground truth reconstruction that's done from taking the full data set. So that's our training data. Um, and then we need to learn the LED weights. We had a lot of memory problems with that. Um, we were ended up using like, you know, like 32 by 32 pixel patches of the image, which is not ideal, and it could only learn 500 LEDs. We fixed that recently by using, I don't totally understand it, but my student does. Uh, but he pulled an idea from the best paper word from NeuroIPS this year about treating your, your layers like a, an ODE and then you only need to store one at a time because you can, when you do this back propagation, you can predict, you can predict all the other ones from the previous one. Um, and so that saved a lot of memory and we were able to do like the full scale problem now. Um, and we're just started, starting to apply this towards the diffuser cam problem and other problems. But you have to reformulate it a little bit to do so. And it's certainly not my expertise. That's, you would have to talk to the student who did it if you wanted to know more details. Daniel? So in the construction, you rely on the assumptions of, say, angles of LED, for example, and so on. And if you put a slightly different sample, say, thickness is slightly different, now the angles will be different. How robust is this? Do you have to recalibrate everything? or? Uh, what do you mean? So if you you can put whatever sample you want, it should be yeah, constructed. If, if it's a, a like if, sample, right? The angles now. Um, I think the angles don't change on what hits the sample. If your sample's thicker than like if you're doing the re 3D reconstruction, it'll just show up at different places, right? So if your sample's off focus, it's also not a problem. You'll reconstruct the complex field at the focus plane, and you can digitally refocus it to the correct plane afterwards if you want to. So for a thin sample, there is a focus plane that it, it will reconstruct this plane, and if your sample's off that plane, then, uh, then you, you need to figure that out yourself after you reconstruct it. If your sample's thick, then you should be doing the 3D reconstruction, and it should, it's going to have some like nominal z equals zero plane, but uh, if it's just thick, thicker in one direction or the other, it should just reconstruct that correctly. So, so I think maybe... Um what I would suggest is that we uh, thank Laura for a really fascinating talk, and then anyone who uh, would be interested in talking, I think she can stick around for a little while. And